Hi, my name is Adesua, and welcome back to another episode of From Dropout to JD. This week's guest's name is Jack. Everyone, meet Jack. Hi. Hi. So, Jack, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Uh, let's see. I'm uh, 37 years old. I, uh, uh, I'm an attorney. I do landlord-tenant relationships, um, which is a really fancy way of saying I'm a lot of people's last line of defense when it comes to being evicted. Okay. Um, I uh, have a family. Um, I met my wife 10 years ago. We've got two beautiful boys, um, and we live in Colorado. And what was your relationship with, well, first of all, Colorado is beautiful. I like have this yes. because I'm obsessed with Colorado. So that's really cool. Um, how long have you lived there? Uh, so I grew up here. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So I, uh, I, uh, I grew up here from about three weeks until I was 19. Mm -hmm. um, and then I left. Uh, and then I did kind of like a little tour of America, which oh. I mean, I'll get into a little bit. Um, I lived in Florida. I lived in New Jersey. I lived in mm. Orange County, California. Uh, and then I ended up back here. Okay. So, right on. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, my next ahead. question is your education background. Like what was that like um, in Colorado or wherever else you did your, got your degrees? Uh, yeah. So I did my degrees at the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, and uh, I was a bit of a late bloomer on that one. Um, I started when I was 26. Um, it was my third attempt at college. Okay. And uh, yeah, and then I, so I graduated there. Um, on my 30th birthday, I graduated. Oh. And uh, uh, yeah, and then I went to University of Denver Law School that fall. That's so cool. Yeah. So did you have any issues with high school, like when exactly did you drop out? I mean, I know you said you did it three times, but when did it start? Yeah, well, so there was no like official dropout date for when I left high school. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I spent um, I spent a lot of my high school years uh, with some different priorities um, than maybe most high schoolers have, um, which is, you know, to say I was, I spent them drunk <laughs> and high and, um, you know, I, uh, 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 anything that got in the way of mm -hmm. my drug and alcohol use, I cut out my life. And, um, so that meant I didn't really go to class a lot. And by the time it was, you know, getting close to graduation, they said, well, listen, you're, you're going to have to, uh, stay an extra year and a half if you want your diploma. And, you know, I raised the proverbial defiant middle finger and walked out got my GED uh the day before everybody else in my uh class my graduating class got their diplomas okay okay so. that's interesting I'm gonna have to ask at some point how you wrote your character in fitness it in them but I'm a little bit more curious about why you traveled the U.S. to the extent that you did I went to different rehabs Oh, okay. <laughs> Word. so yeah, I, I, um, I, after I, after I left high school, um, I discovered hard drugs and, um, uh, specifically crystal meth and that very quickly became the love of my life. And so, you know, as, as much as I had described earlier, like I was chasing getting outside myself. Um, I, 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 I found out that this did all of the things that I thought I needed in my life. Um, it also tricked me all at the same time. And so about 18 months after I started uh, using meth, I, mm -hmm. um, I, I, in 12 step fellowship, they call it hitting bottom. Um, and uh, I, I picked up seven felonies um, and they were looking at, you know, sentencing me to something like 16 to 25 years and I, you know, we can call it a divine intervention. Um, an attorney told me that uh, I could choose to go to rehab oh. and get some of these, you know, charges dropped. And so that's what I did. And I figured it was going to be like, okay, I'm going to go. It's going to be like summer camp and I'll come back in three months and pick up right where I left off. 
And they saw right through that. So the first one was in Florida and I was there for 95 days. Okay. And they, and they kicked me out and sent me to a long-term treatment center in New Jersey. Okay. Um, where I, I lived there for 14 months. And then I graduated that program after, you know, pulling my head out of my ass. And um, they sent me to Orange County for like aftercare. Okay. Um, because that's uh, kind of a mecca for young people in recovery. Hmm. Um, in, in, in the states um but it was it was it was it was after that first treatment center that i really like learned that well my life couldn't my life maybe isn't over you know because yeah. i was i was fighting hard against going to the second place and i called the only person that they would allow me to talk to back home which was my attorney um and he told me you know listen i have a year clean off of your drug of choice dude if i can do it you can do it um and go and see if it's as bad as everybody says it is and if it's really that bad we can petition the court for an alternative solution and so i got two things out of that conversation okay one is i could you know potentially be okay if i continue to go there i just trust in the process and two more importantly you can be a drug addict and still be a lawyer Word. So it was, that was what planted the seed that like, you know, I didn't have to live, you know, like, a, like the life of crime for the rest of my life, because I thought that that was it. And so, so, you know, when I was living in California, I tried um, to do college a couple of times um, and it just, I just didn't have the heart for it, but I always had like this, like, Hey, let's go to law school. Let's go do it. Let's, you know. I don't know if it was let's get that achievement on my belt or if it was like let's go help people or if it, or what it was but um that asterisk was always there and so in 2011 uh right before i moved home um i was uh uh i was giving it my like third and maybe final try at college and so i i had just enrolled in a you know a junior college in santa Ana, and they allowed me to transfer my credits here to Denver um, when I moved back home after one semester. So that helped. And, you know, kind of the rest was just kind of history. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That is so it's a, it's impressive. A, Honestly, like seriously, kudos to you because how I perceive law school is that it's very gatekept. I've said this in multiple episodes and I'll probably still say it until I get my JD, but the hoops they have you jump through is are ridiculous. And for you to be able to do that with your background is like highly commendable. So that's really cool. I was really nervous when I submitted those applications. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, they actually, uh, uh, when I submitted my application for the bar exam to sit for the bar exam, I was right. really worried wow. about character and fitness, like you mentioned earlier. And somebody actually recommended that I hire a character and fitness attorney. Okay. That's a thing that exists. Right. Um, and so I did. And, uh, yeah, you know, he took a look at like my record. He took a look at all the documents I had. I mean, I had like letters from all these treatment centers that said, Jack, finish this program, remain sober. <laughs> You know, it was so, and, and then the, the, the felonies that I got were all a deferred adjudication. So, with a little coercion to the court, those disappeared. Uh, oh, okay. Thank God. Um, and so, you know, I mean, if it was, if, if I didn't ultimately, you know, stay clean and graduate rehab, or uh, if I did come back and like pick up where I left off, like I kind of talked about. Um, those would have been actual convictions, all seven of them, and that would have prevented me from having much of a career in any field. Right. I so, think. I don't know. So, how many convictions did you have when after you went through that process? So, I pled. I pled guilty to a felony burglary. Okay. And um, and the condition was three years, no more hiccups, um, and it would become a misdemeanor. Oh, okay. So I have, I, uh, I think I still have a misdemeanor theft conviction from 2004 on my record, but I'm not sure if I haven't looked in a long time. Okay. Wow. That's, I don't know. You're really lucky. That's, that's really impressive. Yeah. I, I really, I really, really am. Um, <laughs> there's, I, I mean, I can't, 
I, I can't I can't say it any other way. Like I I really got I mean it was first time offender. Okay. Um, you know, it was I mean, as far as felonies go, and it was I mean, not like I was uh in front of a judge every few weeks, you know, um, th- that would have been more difficult. And, um, I had, I had a pretty good attorney, um, who, you know, he knew the DA, which helps. Um, and I don't know, you know, I, I wish I knew more about like what the process looked like from the attorney side for that, but that was before I knew anything about what I know now. Right. So this is kind of, I don't know how this kind of is, but I'm curious, how were you able to financially support yourself through rehab and law school and getting the attorney, the character and fitness attorney? Like, how did you uh, manage that? Uh, The honest answer is that I grew up in a very wealthy family. Oh, okay. Word. Um, So, I mean, it it's kind of embarrassing like admitting like yeah okay i got rich white boy privilege but that's what happened that's not embarrassing Um, that's just your background okay yeah you can't you can't change that um okay cool that answers my question um so i want to do like a slight pivot and kind of focus more now on your career um do you like what you do? Would you consider yourself a happy lawyer? Like what's your relationship to law at this moment? Um, I do. I, so I'm corporate in-house for, um, the, uh, uh, for the family business, which is a, we, 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 we build and manage apartment buildings. Um, and so I, I handle, well, I'm, I'm basically the entire legal department, um, which means that, you know, most of my job is negotiating with people who are unable to make their rent, directing them to resources where they can get help. Um, you know, uh, essentially doing everything in my power to prevent them from losing their homes. Okay. Um, I have more power than anybody else in the company to work with them. Um, which is nice. And, uh, uh, it's, it's rewarding. It really is. Um, especially when my efforts, you know, pay off. Um, and just in case people aren't aware of what your title is, can you kind of explain what in-house counsel is? Yeah, so corporate counsel is a position where um, companies hire uh, an attorney to come in and do um, uh, legal advising for them um, for kind of day-to-day issues, uh, repetitive issues, things like that. Um, a lot of companies will still hire outside counsel for specific things. Um, but you know, the, uh, uh, especially in, in real estate, like corporate counsel is, is good for helping to find, you know, uh, ways to draft, um, you know, unique clauses for leases or purchase and sale agreements or, um, uh, you know, and uh, obvious court advisement and all that stuff too. So Okay. And when you came across that specific field, how, I guess, how did you come across that specific field? Was it in law school? Well, it was, it was, it was kind of predetermined. Um, Yeah. So I mentioned it was the family business. Um, So it's, yeah. So, so it was kind of always in the cards that it was going to be real estate at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, I just happened to take it a step further and I decided that I want to go into the legal aspect of it. I see. Um, Yeah. Because I mean, I like, I like, I like finding out how things work sort of behind the scenes and, um, and law school definitely helped figure that out. Okay. Um, And I think a big thing that um, I'm starting to understand is that um, I don't know. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I'm, I don't know what I want to do yet. And I'm really like, when I do these interviews, I'm really trying to pick people's brains to kind of help me figure out and like gain direction in this whole process. So I haven't heard anyone talk about the family business. So that's interesting. Kind of makes me wonder if I hadn't have any lawyers in my family, if that could be a thing, but yeah, I don't know. It's possible. I mean, it's also, it's also, you know, likely that, um, 
you know, once you become an attorney, you could find like a smaller, like family style practice to go, uh, uh, or a, 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 you know, smaller family style business that's looking for corporate counsel or, you know, like a smaller, there's, there's like small attorney firms that have like two or three lawyers or something like that. And they handle like boutique cases, stuff like that. They're, you know, it's a lot easier to achieve work-life balance, um, which is super important. Um, and, uh, you know, you get to, I don't want to say you get to pick and choose which cases you take and what you do with them, but, in, you know, it's, it's, I mean, smaller firms like that, there's a lot more leniency with how you get to operate as an attorney. Right. Interesting. So, so can you expand more on work-life balance? Because that, that's something I actually started when you were talking. That's, I think that's really important for me. It's something I'm really nervous about. Um, how are you, like, what does that look like as an attorney, work-life balance? Well, I, I, can't, I can't speak for other attorneys. Um, I mean, there's, you know, this kind of like trope in, 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 in the, the field that, you know, if you become an attorney, you're not going to have a personal life. Right. And I mean, maybe that's true if you work for some of these like international big law firms. But mm. uh, I mean, I know I know plenty of attorneys who are able to, you know, leave their work at the office and come home and, you know, be family people. Um, I sometimes sometimes you have to let me rephrase that. Sometimes I have to. uh mm change that a little bit like if i'm okay. if i'm if i'm if i have a big trial coming up um that'll take a lot of my evening and weekend time um you know especially like the, the weekend right before the trial happens but um most of the time i'm able to leave my work at the office and i'm able to leave my home life at home and sort of separate the two okay um covid threw a real wrench in the gears with that though oh how was that it was it was confusing <laughs> um uh you know navigating working from the house um with you know all four of us at home um was difficult um and so what i would do is i you know my my, my sort of my work schedule would change mm. um i worked from you know uh during the quiet hours okay um, the kids would be awake from you know i don't know seven till eight p.m and so i would i would work whenever i could you know, when they were up and then after they went to bed, I would, I would crank out all of my real busy work. Okay. How old are your kids? Uh, they're, they're eight and three. Oh, okay. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Wow. So do you feel like you're able to be a present, like a present figure in their lives as an attorney? Cause I really want to have kids and, but I like really want to be a part of their like childhoods is that, is that a real concern I should have? Or what do you think? I think that um, if, um, if, you, if you tend to be an overachiever who is not easily able to switch gears, that might be difficult if you're anything like okay. me. Um, you know, and so... Like I really, uh, you know, when I, when I was working out of the home, I really had to figure like, okay, this is family time. This is work time. Okay. Um, you know, and, and just kind of set a schedule as if I were in an office with that, um, you know, and, and, and so I think, I think it's definitely possible um, because that's been my experience. Um, you know, even, even during law school, I mean, I did, I, I, I worked, I, I had my nose to the wheel a lot more when I was in law school and studying for the bar Right. than I do now. And, um, and I had to treat law school like it was a nine to five job. Okay. And so I would, you know, I'd go, I'd do all my classes, I'd stay there till five, come home. Um, and then it was family time till the boys went to bed, and then back to the back to the books. Okay, so you were a parent in law school. I was, yeah, my oldest was born my junior year of college. Wow, okay. That's really impressive. I'm like trying to wrap my head around that. And then my youngest was born after my first bar exam. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Tell me more about that. Um, how is like, how, which one's worse, the bar or like law school admissions? Uh, I mean, law school admissions weren't bad for me. Okay. Um, I, had, uh, I, had, I had a decent LSAT score. I had a 155. 
Oh, okay. Or 255. Is it one or 200? I don't remember. It's one. It was, okay. It's 55, whatever it was. <laughs> um, and my GPA was, was really good. Um, I had a, I had a 3.83 GPA coming in. Oh, okay. And so that helped. Um, the only school that waitlisted me that I applied to was CU Boulder. Um, oh, okay. And, and so Colorado, we only have two law schools here and one's Denver and one's Boulder. And I live closer to DU. Um, and so that was like my school of choice. And then I applied to several schools across the country that I knew would be like guaranteed, um, guaranteed entry. Um, so I, as far as law school admission, I think my, 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 my biggest advice for that is, um, you know, if you have the ability to, you know, move about the country, if you're not tethered to a certain place, mm -hmm. um, apply, apply for some T4 schools that are definitely like a guaranteed home run. Um, and, and you might get some, you know, scholarship money out of that too. Uh, and, you know, and that way, if, you know, your whatever school is your first choice, uh, you can go and, you know, if you don't get into that one for whatever reason, then you have a, fall, a, a fallback plan. Right. Um, so, you know, but um, in, in terms of like what was on my law school application, uh, that I don't think affected my admissions process very much. Um, studying for the LSAT was tedious. Um, studying for the bar was grueling. And I had to do that three times. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So, um, if you don't mind, I'm curious, um, why is it? Cause you had kids, like what was the reason for taking the bar three times? Um, kids, ADHD, um, okay. just couldn't hang. I mean, I don't know. There's, there's a bunch of reasons. Um, you know, uh, uh, the way the bar exam is tested is that, so Colorado is a uniform bar exam state and there's oh, something nice. like 38 or 40 states that use this bar exam and they all have different score requirements. Um, and then I think Colorado's is a 276. And I think there's only two states that are higher than that. That's Maine and Alaska. And, um, and so, so, you know, my first bar exam, um, I had done, uh, everything in the way that I was, you know, instructed to, I went to, uh, uh, the university of Denver also had like a bar success program that I, that I went oh. to and I studied. Um, and so, and, you know, I, I kind of used that and Barbary in tandem to try and get everything going. And so I did really well on the essay portion in the bar exam. Nice. Um, and then the, the evening of the, or the afternoon of the first day is something called the MPT, which is the practical test uh, the multi-state practical test which is where they give you like a library of you know facts and law and you have to extrapolate and write a memo or um the ceiling burst open and a leak started in the middle of our in the middle of the bar exam in uh uh july of 2018 and um so they paused the bar exam and had to fix you know and move a bunch of people around and I think it's the first time in like Colorado history they've ever stopped the clock on the bar. And so coming back from that was difficult. Um, and then the second day is all multiple choice questions. It's called the MBE. And that was, that was the part that killed me. Mm. Um, and I later learned it was because I didn't use, I didn't, I, I, I didn't stick to the method that like they taught me to use uh to answer these questions because i got i don't know stressed or excited or something happened and i just didn't do it and so so um i got my score and i missed it by about 10 points uh, ouch yeah it was rough it was rough the second one i missed by four points Ooh. and the third one i passed by three points so <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was it was it was rough um and uh, I, yeah, I definitely cried when I got my results the third time. Aww. Um, I, I was so happy, you know, I was like, oh, I don't have to do this again. Wow, that's um, amazing. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I used to say that, you know, getting sober and getting clean was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I will definitely say that passing the bar exam is the hardest thing I've ever done. That's so insane. Oh, my yeah. God. But worth it. Yeah, I mean, definitely worth it. There's there's a lot of people that say like, you know, the, the, the bar exam is a good minimum 
competency test for lawyers. It's not a good minimum competency test for lawyers. It's, uh, you should be able to practice if you have a law degree, and so on and so forth. I don't necessarily agree that the bar exam is a good competency test for lawyers. Um, right. Because it's, it's all based on archaic antiquated law. Mm. So you spend, you know, two to three months studying for the bar exam, if you're lucky and you pass the first time. And then you have to go out into the world and learn, you know, the law of the land wherever you're living. That's what I suspected. And I, I'm glad you confirmed that. You're like the third or second attorney who has confirmed that, which I guess I'm happy about because then it kind of takes the pressure off taking in the information. But then what's the point? Like, what are you right. in school for? I guess to learn the history. Well, yeah. So the, the reason the, the law school isn't there to teach you, here's the laws of your state. Mm-hmm. Law school is to teach you, you know, okay, here's how to dissect the rule of law in a case and here's how to apply it to a certain set of facts okay you know it, it, it's it, they're molding how, how how an individual thinks rather than you know just teaching a bunch of law and you know giving you the ability to regurgitate that later okay so yeah so um have you made it far in the law school practice uh, or process where are you oh thank you for asking i'm currently studying for the lsat it is okay very tedious that was a great word he used um I work 40 hours a week um I don't have kids thank god so it's not as not as difficult as you but um it's it's pretty don't minimize it it's tough it's really tough it's actually I'm like tired after work and I heard someone say that if you work for that long you can build up endurance to where you can like sit for hours I also have ADHD. That's not the case for me. I want to bliss out and just vibe after work, not study even more after a long day being, you know, in front of a computer. Absolutely. It's really becoming like, I'm starting to see why it's so challenging, but once I'm able to hack this and be able to study for it, I'll, I'll be like a better for that. Like, I, I feel like it's preparing me to be able to study for law school because I know that'll be easier than right now while I'm working. That's such a glorious mindset to have. I had to do the same <laughs> thing. I'm serious. I did. I, you know, so I'm studying for the LSAT, right? And it's ar- an arduous process. And, you know, but it's setting, it's setting the stage because once I got to law school, I was already accustomed to the idea of, okay, well, I have a job. Um, so I know what a nine to five is. This is my second career. Um, so I was able to, you know, conform, conform a work schedule to my studies. Um, but the actual like reading and processing and using the logical part of my brain, Mm -hmm. as much as I started doing the LSAT really was what started that. It was, it was a great jump start. Do you have a favorite section? Um, I'm hoping it's going to be logic games right now. The course I'm in is really logical reasoning heavy, which okay. is like a whole different language. Um, it is, it is, but, but I feel like once I learn the language, I'll be good. I just need to like stick with it. Um, Elliot, um, someone I previously interviewed gave the good advice to approach it like a math test and just like, just consume problems. And that's how yep. Instead of like thinking like, oh, I need to know this word or like being more critical thinking, it's really just about getting problems under your belt. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's the same part of the brain, right? It's, you know, um, it's uh, the logical reasoning stuff is really just making an equation out of Mm. the the wall of text that they throw out of you. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll ask you, you know, and I, I mean, you know, to read the question first, right before you go into the 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 wall of text i mean i've heard so many different things i'm trying to figure out what works oh. for me but do okay. you think that's like something you would like something you really feel passionate that's about? what i it's it's what worked for me on the lsat and it's what worked for me on the bar exam because it set the stage okay for what i was looking for um and i, I realize i'm using that cliche a lot but it set the stage it did okay um so you know i'll read like well what is what is the uh, what is the logical outcome of blah blah blah? I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly what the LSAT questions look like, but the, but the, the actual call of the question 
and then go and read and like find out what the relevant info is and it's like okay well you know many of so and so is not and then knowing what the opposite of many is what the opposite of is uh, of all and you know because it's, it is it's different on the lsat like you said yeah so the lsat is a beast and um it is. i'm in that uncomfortable process of like conforming to the test um which is it is what it is like i'm about to move to i'm in dallas i'm about to move to dc and I'm hoping that change will be like the shock to the system I need to like reorganize my life and integrate the LSAT into it. Hopefully, okay. fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, I know that it'll work out. I just can't see it. I mean, honestly, right now I'm really working on my personal statement and my like diversity statement because that's something that's more... It was funny. Like I didn't want to do that work until I started doing the LSAT and I was like, oh wait, like there's got to be something better out there for me in this process and it's like <laughs> writing stories it's kind of enjoyable um what did you write about uh i wrote about my recovery oh okay that's and strong having, yeah having a new like kind of lease on life i wow. figured i would um i figured i would uh get that out of the way from the get-go that's smart and you know let them open that book and see like okay well here's what this guy's you know he's 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 already telling us he's going to have a record he's already telling us that he's you know brushed up with the law he's already telling us this that and the other thing and so there weren't any surprises when i went to go sit for the bar exam um and do character and fitness and you know there was you know oh well <laughs> look at these giant asterisks um so that that seemed like an apropos thing but um i you know it's it, it it's easy to tie that into, you know, helping other individuals because right. that's, that's what 12-step right. fellowship is all about. Wow. So um, we have a couple more minutes. We have about six minutes left. And I just wanted to ask out of curiosity, what was your least favorite and most favorite part of law school? Um, What was my least favorite part of law school? Um, I had a lot of professors who went off on like really tangential, who knows what <laughs> conversations. I don't, you know what? I don't, I won't say I had a lot of them, but I had one specific one who comes okay. to mind. And I actually took a second course with this guy um, by choice um, <laughs> because he was the only one who taught it. Oh, okay. But by then, by then I was, uh, 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 um, I had decided that it was time to get treatment for ADHD. It was easier for me to kind of, you know, uh, I got a friend who likes to call it land the plane, which is mm -hmm. where you tie it back into what you're originally, you know, okay. learning about. Um, but, uh, uh, so, so it, it, that made it a little easier for me, but it was still, you know, like knowing when I'm listening to what's important and knowing when I'm listening to him talk about being in JAG in Siberia. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, um, so I, I guess kind of having to, to learn that on off switch was, I, I would say the, my least favorite part of law school, you know, it, it, and, and, and I can't say that it's, you know, like reasonable to expect, you know, a professor to just only talk about the substance of the course because that's mechanical and boring, but, you know, um, having the ability to stay on task at least through half the class is great. <laughs> right. Um, my favorite part about law school would be, um, honestly, I'd say the friendships and camaraderie. Oh, you know, good. I managed, I, I managed to, uh, you know, connect with a really great group of friends. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, and now we're all over the country um which is pretty cool and so you know every so often you know when any of us are in each other's city it's like never left wow you know, which is really cool so you still are friends with the people that you've like the friendships you made in law school yeah some of them okay um i i definitely hold almost all of the people i went to law school with in high regard um you know so uh I didn't really come across anybody that I didn't like, which was, which was nice. 
Okay. Um, That's impressive. Hmm. So, sorry, if I'm trying to extend this because I don't want to cut you off. Um, okay. Zoom updated their terms and you can only do 40 minutes for free. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to pay. Okay. And I'm like, you know what? Like, this is a good conversation. I don't want to rush it. So let me just quickly try and pay for this. Um, so that's what I'm doing while I'm holding this interview. <laughs> okay. Um, but my next question was going to be like the last two I usually ask is, um, do you have any advice for someone who had a similar story to yours who may be struggling with addiction and needing assistance or like words of encouragement? Um, I, I think the most important thing for people who are struggling with any sort of addiction, whether it's drugs and alcohol or food or sex or relationships or anything, is that it doesn't mean that it's the end of the line you know, change is possible. And you just got to reach out to people who have gotten through it and who can show and help you how to do it. That's, I think, the biggest thing. Um, you know, as far as getting through law school as a sober individual, um, it was difficult. <laughs> all the events, all the events are, you know, are, are, are uh, alcoholic events. And um, a lot of, I mean, the legal profession is a drinking profession. It's not right. a secret. And so actually while I was at, while I was at DU, I helped uh, a couple of other students spearhead a, uh, like a mental wellness um, program for people who are experiencing um, uh, uh, alcoholism or problem drinking or drug addiction or any other mental, mental health um issues and with the help of some of the deans and like the student health and wellness center um, we were able to bring in anonymous weekly counseling with graduate students of the uh, social work this college of social work okay. um, we were able to get the student organizations to commit to doing one event per semester that was alcohol free oh, um, wow. there was there was there was a uh, like a I don't want to call it like a sober com like committee or a sober community just because um, that word kind of means like people who have had a problem and stop drinking or stop using and, 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 and there's people who never drank in the first place and prefer just not to be at events that have that stuff. And there were several, several people of that caliber who, you know, came and, and, and met with us as well. And so, so it was, it was really kind of a nice like little sub subcommittee, sub community we had um you know so i guess i say all that to say like find like-minded people you right. know find, find the like-minded people and hold on for dear life because it is a hell of a ride yeah oh my gosh that's such a big signature in my life right now like community uh but um i'm so like i'm so into mental health like if i could be a mental health advocate i would love that. I think I'm going to work hard to see if I can find an intersection with law and mental health because I that's work I'm very passionate about. Um, and I think if it's it, possible, like people do neuroscience in law. So like, you know, character and fitness. Yeah, um, there's a lot of intersectionality between law and mental health in housing. Oh, um, if you can believe it. Um, there's a lot of people who are on like housing vouchers through um, various government programs um, with the VA. Um, there are uh, 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 a lot of Section 8 vouchers. Um, okay. Uh, you know, and, 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 the, and the big component of that often is mental health. Um, you know, I mean, especially for like veterans or people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, you know, um, cause that takes a toll, you know, I mean, whether or not you had a, any mental health, uh, any spiciness, if you will, going into it, you know, you're going to have some coming out. And, uh, uh, and, and so I, I think, you know, having, 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 a, having a legal education and a knowledge of social work, a knowledge of um, psychology would be beneficial to any organization who provides housing to, uh, right. you know, lesser than less fortunate individual, uh, people. Right. That's interesting. I never thought of 
like the, that intersection i would have not known unless someone had told me like that's super cool um, lot, yeah i mean a lot of i mean it's not something a lot of people think about yeah that's true um I'm, i want to circle back real quick so yeah when you like you you have an issue with addiction um, and you, that was, was that not at the forefront of your mind, like going into a career that's known for having like high addiction rates? Like, I know you did something about it in school, but was that not something like a red flag, I guess you could call it? Um, I, I yeah, it was definitely something I was nervous about, Okay. you know, knowing about it, but um, I, there's such an issue with substance abuse in the legal field that almost every single state has a lawyer assistance program for people who have those experiences. Hmm. Um, and they're partially funded by, bar, by, by the bar dues. Um, so like Colorado's is called COLAP and it's, it's, it, it, it's an acronym for the Colorado Lawyer Assistance Program. And, um, and they, they actually have um, a, uh, a higher standard of confidence than any other attorney client protected relationship um in the state of colorado so the supreme court anything you you know if you if you are brought in as um i don't know a client of collab because you drank through your you know your, your trust account or whatever right um uh you can go to collab and they can help you with that and 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 the even the supreme court can't break that confidence huh so yeah, I um, I was volunteering with them through law school as well to take you know law students who needed to to AA and ACA meetings, um, and uh, so I got involved with them, but um, kind of fell through the cracks after the bar exam. Okay, hmm. so you were I'm just trying to like put it into like a summary of what your situation was. So you knew that you had this issue, but that wasn't going to. Def- like deter you from your dreams of helping people with a law degree and like what were some things that like helped you because I'm I can only imagine that there was some pressure on you um yeah I mean pressure to to succeed in law school or just like I don't know like the weight of like stress is I guess a better word for it like you felt the stress of law school and I sure. I haven't struggled with addiction to your extent but I have you know like struggled with things like that so whenever like it's a coping mechanism so right. if I'm stressed out I want to go to this coping mechanism that I know works for me so and that's something I want to okay word <laughs> <laughs> um that makes sense um but I'm just curious like how do you like, do you have more words on that? Because I find it like incredibly fascinating. Yeah, I, you know what? I I can tie this into work life balance um, as well because it's it's really important to be able to. So there's a lot of um, oh god, I read a really great word about it the other day. Hmm. Uh, is it called proxy proxy emotions or uh, it's like where 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 um as attorneys, we tend to work with people who are experiencing some pretty high levels of stress because of their position. Okay. Right. Um, especially in like criminal defense and family law, stuff like that. Um, and, and so a lot of attorneys, the reason that there's such a high level of, uh, uh, substance abuse in the legal industry is because those emotions then become our own. And it's hard to separate that and then come home and not allow that to, you know, and not allow those emotions to affect my home life as well. Um, and uh, so I think having the ability to, to, to separate that and, you know, realize like, okay, um, it's been a pretty rough day. I'm going to check in with my wife on my way home and let her know, like, I'm, 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 I'm feeling emotionally drained a little bit. I'm going to take a few extra minutes before I come in, um, so that I can hit that reset button so I can be dad, you know, um, having the ability to, it, it it takes a lot of self-awareness, right. You know, and knowing like, and checking in with myself and being like, okay, am I, how am I feeling right now? You know, um, 
and 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 really just being able to um, to identify like the bad days. Right. Um, as far as de-stressing, um, I think you know, like you said, everybody has vice, um, and uh, I mean, for some people, that could be. Um, you know, playing video games after they get home from work. For some people, that could be cheese sandwiches. I don't know. Um, you know, but like whatever, whatever, whatever we can do for self care is so so important. Hmm. Okay, I love this little self love conversation. Oh, it's, it's so important. <laughs> it is because it's so easy to forget, especially in law school. Yeah. No. So. I it's like the small simple things like if right. you're not feeling good you need to do something to make yourself feel better so that's right. that's cool yeah. god but it's easier said than done like things that make it me is. feel better is like money <laughs> like i i don't know it, it what certainly else. helps or like spending <laughs> money like i those right. are the things i enjoy to do i like a good massage that's not free so right you can say all that but like how do you actually go about it when there's like obstacles kind of stopping you from doing the things that give you pleasure or relax you um yeah it's tough i mean especially in law school you know so yeah. i mean like the aba the aba um aba accredited schools don't typically let people work more than about 20 hours oh. um during their first year of law school so check check out whether you're gonna have to do that or not that's um so that you're not surprised later yeah that's interesting I, I so, kind of like it, but I kind of like I like the fact that they're kind of looking out for their students, but no, I like it because I don't I want an excuse to not work. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why I'm excited to go back to school uh, is to not have to work a, a job that I like. I, I like working. I'm not like a, I'm a hard worker. I, mm -hmm. I would view myself as ambitious, but I'm also very passionate and like emotion driven. So if I'm not like emotionally invested, I'm going to burn out. Like it's just inevitable. So I want work that like moves me the way, like, I like the way you talk about what you do. Like that's something that's inspiring for me to hear. And that gives me hope, especially doing this LSAT and all this other BS to like get into law school. It's so nice to hear people say like, oh yeah, I'm a lawyer and I'm helping people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, and I, I kind of had to figure out how to spin it at first. Cause it was like, Oh God, is, am I going to be evicting people for the rest of my life? Oh, is God. that, okay. is that, is that my purpose? And so, yeah. and like, okay, yeah, I represent a landlord's interest, but also like I have the ability to keep people in their homes if they can, you know, if they can meet us halfway or whatever. Right. You know, you know, so I, you know, like I have that ability to help people um, and, uh, and I, I mean, I, I ride with that. Okay. So, Interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of attorneys out there who are like, you know, don't go to law school. Right. Um, I'll never be one of those guys. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, I mean, I went to, I went, I originally went to law school cause I was like, Hey, I could, I could do this um and then and then i stayed in law school because it was a challenge um part of the reason that high school wasn't that important to me was it, because it didn't it didn't challenge me um okay. you know and i didn't have a lot of things that that did challenge me and so when i was in law school i i, I was giving it all in one of one of these classes and i failed it um and, uh, and so, so that was like kind of the reality check that I needed um, to realize like, okay, it's the big leagues now. It's time to, you know, suit up and show up. I got to redo this. Otherwise, you know, they're going to cut me loose and, um, mm. uh, you know, and I'm not going to, I'm going to be out two and a half years with nothing to show for it. Mm. Um, so I, yeah, I had to retake evidence. Um, and and that, that was when I, I finally went and got uh, ADHD treatment. Um, because yeah. I was trying to self-manage for 34 years of my life and wow. it just, I couldn't do it anymore. So like, do, do you see a difference with the medication? Oh yeah. I mean, I've been, I, I've been, uh, I've been doing ADHD treatment for five years now. So oh, right on. Um, yeah, it's definitely been, 
beneficial. Um, you know, I, I, one thing that I, I thought was really interesting was like, I was expecting it. So I was expecting it to be kind of like how like antidepressants work. It's like, okay, well you take one pill and it works after your body gets accustomed to it. It works, you know, all the time. Right. ADHD, ADHD medication is like, okay, well this works for like six hours after, you know, I take my pill in the morning. And so I got to knock out all of my like really heavy duty focus work before that wears out. And so, so kind of um, figuring out how that worked in my life was difficult. Okay. Um, but once I got sort of the, uh, uh, once I got the, the, the lay of how that works, everything else kind of fell into place, which was nice. Okay, interesting. So I guess kind of, I don't know if this connects at all, but I'm like, I need to land the plane. I don't know if I use that also. That's what it is. <laughs> okay, cool. I was trying to circle back. Um, my last question for you is, uh, is there any, any regrets you've had? And if so, what? Um, or if not, why? Any regrets in terms of my legal education or? Yeah, your whole um, law process. You know what? I have one. I have oh. only one regret. Only one. Um, I went and did an internship at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Development when I was at when I was in law school, because I wanted to get experiential knowledge. I wanted to make, make sure that we never had to deal with them because I was working in the discrimination department, right? And I actually extended my internship there two more semesters. Um, if I could go back and do it all again, I would have done the HUD internship for one semester, and then I would have gone and worked at a law firm for an internship okay. because when I, when I, when I left law school, I didn't know anything about trial and I had to figure mm. that out and navigate it, um, with just a single mentor. And I, you know, I didn't have any supervising attorneys or anything like that. So, you know, I mean, uh, uh, this November will be three years that I've been a barred attorney and, oh. um, I, I still am not really sure what I'm doing. <laughs> so the, the imposter scary. syndrome is real so yeah so my, my 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 biggest regret is not getting law firm experience when i should have done okay that's good advice well jack thank you so much for doing this interview this honestly has been one of my favorite conversations it was so candid and real and just interesting like you've been through so much and i'm like happy that you were able to share it with us so thank you so much of course um yeah this is we have had a ball have we not yeah no fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is great so yeah thanks for uh thanks for reaching out yeah okay well bye yeah. take care